First Chronicles 29, 11, and 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and, sp and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Jesus, we love you. 
Please rise as we sing of the joy Christ brings in the midst of storms of life as we sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of 441, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. and welcome them this morning. hope everyone found three people. Okay, very good. Well, it is so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Uh, what a wonderful day it is to worship uh, together in the house of the Lord. And a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, one, if you are a guest with us today, there is a green card in the seat back in front of you. We ask that you go ahead and fill that out. We'd love to get connected with you and just kind of help you learn all about the exciting things that are happening here at the church. Uh, a few other things just to keep in mind. Number one, VBS is going to be coming in this next month, July 22nd. Uh, we will be having VBS, and it's so critical because I, I promise you, if I were to say how many of you accepted Christ, we'll just do this. Is it okay if we do this a little informal poll? Judy Puckett says it's okay. Okay, so we're going to go. If you accepted Christ before the age of 18, just go ahead and raise your hand for a second. Yeah, see, that's why we do VBS. That's why it's so important. You can put your hands down, if you will. It's so, it's so important because it's so, we want to sow those seeds of the gospel into the kids at such a young age. And so it's very critical that we do that. Secondly, we're going to have our children's outing uh, that Colby Zamora is going to be leading up. It's, uh, it's at Salado Wildlife Education Center. Uh, I'm so glad it was an education center because in Texas, Salado is a, uh, it's a salad bar. And so... I, when she said, we're going to Salado's, I said, I don't know about that one. That, we might need to, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? Okay, and then number three, uh, 
today where there are no children's activities except for babies and toddlers, we're going to have the children's sermon once a month on the fourth Sunday of every month. We come together um, and we have the children come up and then we encourage them to sit back with their families because it's so important for us to worship as a family because that is absolutely what we are. So if you would, would you please join me in a word of prayer before we have our children's sermon? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are mighty. We thank you that you are strong enough. We thank you that you are able. God, we ask that you would minister to each and every one of us. Maybe some of us have spoken needs, but a lot of us have unspoken needs. We ask that you would speak to that part of our lives this very morning. We also ask that you would be with, uh, with us during this time. Let your presence be felt. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're a kiddo, I want to encourage you to come on up for our children's sermon. Since Colby Zamora is not here, I'll be the one, me and my wife will be the ones leading it. Come on up, kids. Come on up. Yeah, come on. Keep coming up. Any more? We got one more. All right. Come on up. Oh, yeah. He doesn't want to miss out. He doesn't want to miss out. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Today we are talking about trusting in God. And a specific time when the disciples had to trust God, they were in the middle of a storm. What do we know about storms? What's something that you see when it storms? Yes. Lightning. Caroline. Thunder, water. Um, storm, like, um, like big waves. Waves, yeah. Pastor's kid. Dark clouds. Dark clouds, very good, very good. Yeah, those are all things when, it's, when it storms. What about, have you ever seen hail? Yeah. That's a little bit scary, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, well, let's read from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took with them in the boat just as they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep in the, on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Okay, kiddos. Today the sermon is titled, Do You Trust Me? I need a volunteer. <laughs> I think I'm going to go with Lieutenant Dan. Oh, he's y'all Sunday school teacher. Come here, Lieutenant Dan. All right, I need you to stand right there, okay? <laughs> I need you to hold your hand out, both of them. Okay, now hold them far out. No, towards me. So, like you're holding a cup. Like you're holding a cup. Okay. All right. Put them up a little bit. Okay. You good? Is he good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, do you trust me, Lieutenant Dan? Okay. Oh, uh-oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's children's message, Dan. Okay. Okay. So, now, what I want you to do is I want you to put that on top of your head. Put it, no, just like that, up top, up top, just like that. Okay. Now, I want you to... I want you... 
to slowly turn around 360 degrees, okay? And everybody, okay, let's do that. 360 degrees. Okay, now stick your cup out just like this. Okay, now do you trust me? Now pour it on your head. Pour it on your head. Sometimes, sometimes what we think is a storm doesn't actually turn out to be the storm we think. And sometimes we go through storms and the, the ending that we thought it was going to be doesn't always turn out like we think it's going to be. God can always step in and do a miracle. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. Hey, I got to clap this time. Good. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, let's, why don't we pray, and then we're going to go back with your family, okay? Let's pray together, all right? Dear God, thank you, thank you, thank you for these little ones. We ask that they would grow up to know you and love you, and that when they come to the storms and the problems of life, they would cling to you because you can do the wonderful and the miraculous. In your name we pray, amen. All right, y'all go back, go back to your kid, parents. I just don't know how I'm gonna make ends meet. I did my best now, I'm scared to death that we might lose everything. And when a sickness takes my child away and there's nothing I can do, my only hope is to trust in you.
Horatio Spofford wrote the words to It Is Well with My Soul after a series of tragedies in which his two-year-old son died, his business failed, all four of his daughters perished in a shipwreck. He and his wife um, went to across the Atlantic, went about to where they had uh, lost their daughters, and at that time, he wrote the words to this beloved hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. So please rise as we remember that no matter what our storms are, it is well in our souls because of God's promises to us.
Father, we're reminded by these songs that we've sung and the scripture that we've read that you're not only the provider, but you're the sustainer of our lives. And Father, we just thank you for that. We recognize, Father, that all that we have is yours, that we, in fact, ourselves are yours. And Father, help us to give in that light. We ask that you watch over these gifts, that you help us to use them wisely and in a way that would please you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
well, well. Very good. Well, I'd like to begin by telling you the story of a guy named Larry Walters. Larry Walters was a truck driver in the 80s in Southern California. And he uh, had been a truck driver for many, many years. And uh, he would basically, at the end of every shift and at, uh, on every weekend, he would, uh, he would, what just that? Oh, that's, <laughs> there was a ringer? Okay, sorry, sorry, you're good. Okay, so, uh, so, so Larry would, he would, at the end of every shift, he would go out in his backyard and he would just have his Sears lawn chair and he would uh, just veg out. He would, he would eat, you know, chips and and sandwich he'd eat some sandwiches and he would have some coca-cola and he would just watch the southern or the the sunset and and one day larry said to himself you know what my life is a little vanilla I, i think i need some adventure in my life and so one day he got the idea boy i tell you you know what i'm gonna do i've got my little sears lawn chair you know the ones that were woven you know what i'm talking about the ones in the 80s. Okay, he got that little line chair and he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tie some helium balloons to it because I want to get up as high as the trees. And so Larry thought to himself, okay, well, I've got to get about 40 balloons to do this. And his ultimate goal was just to get as high as the tree line, which is probably about double the size of the ceiling, right? And his whole goal was he just wanted to get some, some water balloons and throw them at the kids and just have fun and probably get arrested. I don't know. But, you know, uh, he, so he did this. And so he tied 40 balloons, helium balloons, to his Sears lawn chair. And with the help of some friends, on July 17th, 1982, Larry cut the cord to all 40 helium balloons. Now, the goal was just to get a couple hundred feet in the air. Larry Walters got 17,000 feet in the air. He was first seen by a pilot in the middle of the air, and the, and the pilot said, uh, flight control, we have a problem. <laughs> yeah, you bet you do have a problem. He, he said, I think I see a man in a chair with balloons. And flight control said, no, 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 you, you, what's going on with you? Something's wrong. But then another, another plane came by and confirmed that Larry was actually in, in, uh, in, the, in the air with 40 balloons. Now, here's the deal. Larry had the presence in the mind to have a BB gun with him, and he shot down each balloon, and so he would safely descend down back to the ground. Um, so flight control, you know, obviously authorities were irate with him. They were mad at him. Uh, but the thing about it was it turned out pretty good for Larry. He got to be on Leno. He got to be on Letterman. He actually became a, sponsored by Rolex. I don't know how that one worked out. But he, got, he was sponsored by Rolex, and he actually became a motivational speaker. And so oftentimes people would, would talk to him and say, Well, Larry, why in the world did you tie 40 balloons to your chair? And he said, you know what? I just had a dream, and I had to just cut the cord. And today, my friends, what I suggest to you today is that we're looking at a story. We're looking at this passage where we get the opportunity to proverbially cut the cord and not go and look at life at a tree line level. But in this story, we get to look at a 17,000 foot level of this thing that you and I call life. And when we are up at this 17,000 foot level, what we are going to see is that every single person in this room, every single person who has ever lived, we all face two different kinds of storms. We, sit, we, we face a natural storm and we face a supernatural storm. Every single one of us this morning, we face either a natural storm or a supernatural storm. And so what we're going to do for the duration of this morning is we're going to unpack each and every one of them. So let's first talk about this idea that each and every one of us, uh, we face what is called a natural storm. And so would you look with me at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 and 37 in your seatback Bible. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 and 37, and we're going to read this together. It's I believe it's on page 815. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 37. I'll give you a chance to get there. 
so here it is, verse 35. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. So already what we're seeing as Jesus is the one who's constructing, he's orchestrating, he's the one who's doing this whole situation. This is his mental, like this is his plan, okay? He's the one who called them to go to the other side. Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Verse 36, leaving the crown behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Interestingly, that's where you get uh, the, the phrase, the song, just as I am. No, okay, I was thinking of a joke on the side. It's not it. Okay, so never, never mind. Okay, so verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Verse 38, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion and the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we're going down? Don't you care? In verse 39, Jesus got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Interesting fact, the Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below the, the earth's surface or below sea level. And just a few miles north, there's a mountain called Mount Hermon. And what happens, it happened back then, it still happens even to this day, cold air will rush right off the top of that mountain and it will flood over the sea and the cold air and the warm air will collide and all of a sudden you will get really, really bad storms. So this must have been a tremendously bad storm if professional fishermen are saying we are terrified. This must have been hurricane type winds and hurricane type waves. Now here's what's interesting is that Jesus, he, the way he responds to this is very interesting. Um, Jesus gets up very nonchalantly, and he speaks to the storm like you would an unruly child. Have you ever spoken to an unruly child? Yeah, yeah, we all have. You do not speak in paragraphs. You speak in short sentences. Get to bed. Get outside. Clean your room. Leave me alone. Okay, not that one. All right. Well, maybe sometimes during the summer. But what's crazy about this is Jesus speaks to it as the storm as an unruly child. But the second thing that's interesting is that the wind and the waves obey him like a compliant child. They obey him as a, as a, as a compliant child would. Look with me at verse 39. He got up rebuked the wind and the waves and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. I need you to underline this in your, in your own notes. This is very, very critical. The phrase, the wind died down and it was completely calm, sounds incredibly redundant until you realize he is talking to two different things. When he says quiet, he's talking to the wind. When he says, be calm, he's talking to the waves. He's, he's addressing two different things in this scenario. He's first talking to the wind, and then he talks to the waves. And so you could translate that phrase, it was dead calm. You could say, oh, listen, the wind died down, and then it was dead calm. Has anybody ever seen glass, or seen water that looks just like glass? Uh, I'm, is it okay? Hold on one second. I got a little illustration here. <laughs> a few, last week, I went what is affectionately known as frog gigging. Oh, there's part of the frog. Okay, so I went frog gigging. It was awesome, by the way. I really, I really enjoyed frog gigging. Anybody a frog gigger here? A few of y'all? Okay, well, if you do it, I promise you're going to love it. A couple things I've learned about frog gigging. Okay, number one thing I've learned about frog gigging is that you have to go at the dead of night. If you're going to go frog gigging, you cannot go at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when I would want to go frog gigging. You can't go frog gigging at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You got to go frog gigging when it is completely dark. So, because, you know, it gets dark here like at... 9 30 it's like at 10 30 11 you got to go frog gigging right strike number one for me i like to be in bed at 9 30 I, I just do i like to be at bed at 9 30 go to sleep okay i'm an old man at heart all right get over it right okay number two 
If you're going to go frog gigging, you have to have the right apparel. So I showed up over at with Justin and David, and uh, I, I'm over there, and they got camo, and they're like, they got waders, and they're all, you know, decked out like they're going. And I'm, I'm showing up in like athletic shorts and a t-shirt, right? Like, I mean, I'm completely out of place. But the thing about that I think was interesting was they all had boots. They had, they had big, like, waterproof boots, and I was like, the thing, I said, hey, can I borrow some of those boots? And they're like, yeah, you're going to need them. I'm like, why? Well, you know, there's snakes out there, and they might just nip your heel. Excuse me? They might just nip your heel. You're psychotic. What's wrong with you? It, strike number two. Strike number two. And the, three, the, second, the third thing you need to know about uh, uh, frog gigging is you got to have one of these things. This is called a frog gigging pole series 7321. I don't know, <laughs> but, but it looks like, like a little, like Poseidon's little brother would have this, right? I mean, you, you got to have a little, bowl, you got to have a little frog gigging pole here. And so what you do with a frog gigging is, uh, I'm just going to let you in on some, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the tutorial that I never got, except for when I got it, went out there. So when you, when there's a frog, you're going to shine a light on that frog and the frog, it just stays still. It doesn't even move. And so what you want to do is the other person's going to come up and you've got to gig the frog. Now, the way you gig a frog, <laughs> uh, you don't do, this is what I did. When I saw this frog, I mean, I went all at it. The first frog, I was all, I was all in. I was like, hi <laughs> That frog is now freer than the popcorn they serve at Rural King. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> so David pulled me aside and said, listen, no, 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 listen. When you get up close to the frog, you got to just kind of put it right next to it and then just jam it in with your hips. This is all in the hips, right? Right? That's what Happy Gilmore says. It's all in the hips. Just jam it. And so I, I got a couple of frogs that day, and I, I'll tell you, I'm all about frog gigging. It was fun. It was fun. Uh, I'm very, very glad I went frog gigging. There's something primal about it. <clears throat> I'm probably not going to be a hunter, but I really enjoyed frog gigging. Not that I'm against hunting, I just, it's just not me. So, one of the things as we were going frog gigging, we went to three different ponds, and I'm going to tell you, I knew that it was a full moon that night. I knew, I, it was, it's, in, it's etched in my mind that it was a full moon. Why do I know it was a full moon? Because we went to three different ponds, and all of those ponds, looked like glass, and it was a clear reflection of the moon. Have you ever seen a pond at night, and it looks like a clear reflection of what's above? Jumping back into the story, that, my friends, is what's happening here in this story. Um, we like to, listen, the thing about this is that uh, instantaneously, the winds and the waves stopped. And sometimes when wind, like when a bad storm stops, there's still choppy water. All of a sudden, the water becomes smooth as glass. What is Jesus saying here? What he is saying, this is a very critical point. He is not saying that I am someone who has power. What he is saying is I am the one with power. I am the power. I am the source of all power. Anybody or anything else that has power only has it on loan from me. I myself am the source of all power. On this pathway, listen, so on this pathway called life, there are going to be times where you and I face storms of adversity, a broken marriage, a loss of a job, a loss of a loved one, an ongoing illness. We are going to face these storms. And let me tell you something. Your storms are real. And the storms that you face have the potential, some of them have the potential to take you out. Cancer has the potential to take you out. Bitterness, let me tell you something. Bitterness has the potential to take you out. Uh, sickness has the potential to take you out. Uh, a, a lo losing a, a loved one or a child can feel like it has the potential to take you out. The storms that you and I face in this world, they are real. But my friends, I want to tell you something. Jesus' power is also real too. 
The storms that you and I face, they are absolutely real, but the power that Jesus has absolutely is real too. And I want to be very clear. Some problems that we have are very complex, and you can't just be resolved by, by taking some magic pill or some magic Bible pill that you can get at Lifeway or you know, just you know, listening to some sermon, and all of a sudden it's going to go away. But the encouragement to us all this morning is that in Christ, we can see our problems the way that Jesus sees them. And that is that every single problem is under his power and his control. And so as you go through your natural storm, understand that they are under his power and his control. So you and I will all face what is called a natural storm. But now I think it's also important that we recognize that we also face supernatural storms as well. And so here's what I mean by that. There are some storms in life that come and they are designed to test your faith. There are some storms in this life, they have your name written on it and they are designed to shape your soul. Let's look back at the verse with me. Verse 38 again, let's finish this out. Jesus was in the stern and he was sleeping on a cushion the disciples woke up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? So they were scared. The beginning of the story, they are scared. They're terrified. Or, I mean, they're scared. Verse 39, he got up, rebuked the waves. So this is Jesus and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was a dead calm. Verse 40, he said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Verse 41, and then they were what? terrified. And they asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? So the story starts out, they were scared. Jesus calms the storm and then they rejoice. No, 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 that's not how it goes. No. Okay. No. Okay. They, Jesus, they're in the storm. They're scared. They, Jesus calms the storm and then they are happy. No, that's not how it goes either. I got to get back to this. Okay, no, it says that they were in a storm. They were scared. Jesus calmed the storm, and then it says they were terrified. That is extremely perplexing. I understand this emotion. I understand that before a storm, before a, a, a big event, I understand being scared. I don't understand being in the storm, having it calmed, and then being terrified. I don't quite understand that. But I believe what is going on here is that this is a picture that goes to our hearts because the, the question is, why are they terrified? This is a picture that goes to our hearts because anybody who has tried to live a life of faith has felt like this at one point or another, where everything that is going wrong feels like it's just going to continue to go wrong. Everything that goes wrong does go wrong, and it feels almost like God is asleep in our problems. Have you ever felt like that? You don't have to raise your hand or be honest in this moment. But have you ever felt like God was just asleep or unaware or didn't care about your problems and the things that you're going through and the things that you are struggling through? And the disciples are essentially saying, listen, if you loved me, you would not let me go through this storm. If you loved me, you would not have brought me to this storm. And so how does Jesus respond? Oh, child, I understand. What a big mis miscommunication. No, he doesn't respond like that. He says, no, 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 no. He, he says, why are you afraid? Which is a great question he asks us even to this day. But Jesus' question to them had this thought behind it as to why they were terrified. You're, listen, and this is why I believe they were, they were terrified. What he was essentially saying to the, the disciples, your faith is wrong. Your, your understanding of this faith is wrong. It's off base. The love I have for you and the love you have for me does not insulate you from problems. Just because you love me and just because I love you does not protect you from going through the storms in life. I do allow people I love to go through storms, but you have no reason to be afraid. You have no reason to panic because I am with you through the storm. There are times, my friends, when God will use the storms in our life to test our faith so that you and I might become closer to him. 
Listen, and I want to be very, I want to be very clear. No book, no sermon, no Billy Graham sermon, no hymnal, none of that. There are times that none of those things can get you closer and have that intimacy with Christ than like what a storm can do for you. There are times when nothing else will grow your faith other than a storm that is designed to have your name on it. The testimony of countless believers throughout history is that their relationship with God took a whole new level in intimacy once they went through a storm. You know, I find it very interesting that we live in this culture where we're always looking to deepen our faith, but sometimes it's the storms in our lives, if we have the eyes to hear and the, and the uh, uh, ears to see, no, that's wrong. If we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, there are times that God will use those storms to shape our life. I, I submit to you this morning that we come to know God in a more powerful way in the valleys of life rather than the mountaintop experiences. I submit that to you this morning. Consider this quote from a British uh, journalist who became a Christian later on in life, Malcolm Murridge. No, he wasn't a Harry Potter character, by the way. Okay, Malcolm Murridge. He says this, Contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful, and I look at those with great satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything that I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly brought me closer to Christ has come not through ease, but through pain and affliction. God often uses the storms in our lives to reach the supernatural. He will use the visible to speak to the invisible parts of our life. He will use storms to shape your soul. And I'm reminded of a pretty popular uh, modern day pet, uh, metaphor that kind of uh, addresses this. It's the story about the, the, the bird who had his wings frozen. Anybody remember that one? Cool. All right, good. It's the first time. Okay, there's a story about a little bird who, who got a late start flying south for the winter. And as he was flying south for the winter, he got his wings. He came across a huge snowstorm, a huge ice storm, and his wings got frozen like together, so he could not fly. And so the little birdie went all the way down to the ground, and he thought, and he landed on the ground, and he thought to himself, oh, great, here I am, I'm going to freeze to death. And then out of nowhere comes a cow, and a cow drops some manure on him. And the cow start, and the bird now thinks to himself, oh, well, this is the worst situation ever. So then within a few moments, what he realizes is the warmth from that manure actually starts to warm up his wings and he's starting to thaw it out and he's ready to get going down south. And so this bird is so happy. He starts singing. He starts chirping. He starts loving life. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, it attracts a cat and the cat comes up and eats him out of and, there's the end of the story. <laughs> Three important lessons you and I can learn from this. Number one, not everyone who drops manure on you is your enemy. Number two, sometimes manure-like situations can help us in unexpected ways. Number three, not everyone who digs you out is your friend. If, I, if you would allow me to go to the greater higher principle for a second, I think we see this. This is a principle that's even displayed in the cross. God used what was evil. He used what evil people and Satan were trying to turn and make the very worst. But God transforms it to make it the very best. He took the natural pain of the cross and he turned it into supernatural freedom for all who believe and all who trust in him. You and I, my friends, we are faced with two storms in this life, the natural and the supernatural. And oftentimes God will use the natural to shape and speak into the supernatural parts of our lives if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. And there's one last thing before we close I want to draw your attention to. It's a very interesting point. Um, if you look at that story as a whole, what does this story remind you of? 
Any, does this story like bring out any other story? Or is, it remind, is it reminiscent of another story in the Old Testament? Scholars often look at this story and they compare it to the story of Jonah. Remember we went through Jonah this past year? It's alike in almost every way. It uses the same language, it has the same characters, it even has a lot of the same themes. So when you look at the story of Jonah and you look at this story, these two are almost hand in hand. Both stories take place in where? There you go, Quinn, very good. They take place in the sea and in a boat. Uh, Both stories are described the same way. There's an enormous storm that has the potential to take out everybody. They both have these characters in the, in the boats that are concerned with like being taken over and, and kind of being taken to the sea. Both stories have sailors who wake up somebody who is sleeping and their phrasing to them is this, do you not care that I'm about to drown? Do you not care that I'm about to be taken over by this storm? The stories are alike in almost every single way except for one major way, Right? Jonah was what? Tossed into the sea. Doesn't look like Jesus is tossed into the sea, right? Except I would like to submit to you that if you pull back just a little bit in the life of Jesus, you see, no, he was not tossed into a literal sea that day. But when you look at his three years here on earth in public ministry, he is tossed into a very, very different kind of storm. He was tossed into the storm that had the potential to take each and every one of us out. And that is the storm of eternal justice for the wrongs and the uh, the sins that we have committed. And the storm was not swept away and that storm was not calmed down until Jesus was swept away from the Father on that Friday and reunited with him again on that Sunday. The great truth of this passage is that we can have this image of Jesus on the cross with his head hanging down, uh, enduring that ultimate storm so that you and I know that he will not abandon you or he will not abandon me in the storm that I'm facing today. I know I could throw the rock. I talked about it with Elizabeth. She used to be our secretary here. I'm so sad she's gone. But we would say this all the time. If I just throw a rock here, throw a rock over there, I promise you, if we just start to get to talking, either you or someone you love is facing a storm. And the great encouragement this morning is that Jesus does not abandon us in our storms. And one day, one day, he will calm every storm. And that's the encouragement that you and I need to live as we go out this week. Would you please pray with me? Father, we are so thankful that you are the one who calms all the storms. We thank you that you use the natural storms in our lives so that you might shape our supernatural parts of us and our soul, that you use the storms to shape our soul. God, whoever is going through a storm in here this morning, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that they would feel a peace like they never experienced because they realize and they recognize and they embrace this reality that you withstood the ultimate storm so that we might have victory, so that we might have abundant life. God, we pray a, a word of peace in that storm. In your name we pray, amen. If you're, uh, if, would you please stand with me, if you're able? This is the part of our service where we take steps. Um, if you're here this morning and you have never known Christ, you're in the midst of a storm and you have never known him. You are in the midst of a storm. It feels like water is barricade. Well, first, number one, if you're not in a storm, I want to say congratulations. That's wonderful. I hate to break it to you, but a storm is coming. <laughs> That's just, I hate to break that news to you, but a storm is coming. But if you're here in the middle of a storm, and I want to just, if you need prayer, come down. I would love to pray with you. Number two, if you're here this morning and you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, you feel like you are in this eternal storm, come and settle it this morning. Come and pray with me. Third, if you're here and you'd like to join this church and you say, yes, I want to be a part of a church that, that, that preaches the gospel and that is a friendly church and that is dedicated to, to making a kingdom impact, if that's you, come on down. And lastly, I would say if it's your birthday, it's your anniversary, and you're willing to say, I want to take a step closer to him this year, if that's you, come on down. We'd love to pray for you.
Well, come on down here. We got Frank and Judy Hicks, and it is there. And I asked her, I said, are you coming down because Frank's your storm? <laughs> she didn't like that joke. It, was, it, it went almost as well as like the here I am joke. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are so thankful for both of you guys. Leaders here in the church, uh, very, very thankful for your presence here. They are celebrating 48 years of marriage. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, and I will pray over y'all, and I'll have our final prayer here as well. But uh, one last thing, it, two things really. Parents, please watch your kids. And make sure they do not go get that frog geeker. Uh, Justin and David, y'all might want to get that. So none of the ki- I don't want any kids to get hurt. Uh, three. Uh, secondly, uh, deacons meeting right after the service in the in the choir room, so that we can vote on our. So that y'all can talk about the. Uh, uh, approving our secretary. We got a new secretary. Um, And so let's pray, okay? Father, we thank you for the Hicks. We thank you for their leadership. We thank you for their marriage. We ask that you would continue to unite them um, and that their marriage would be stronger than it ever has in Christ. Um, We thank you for their testimony. We thank you for their leadership. God, we thank you for this church. God, whoever is in here this morning who is facing that storm, know this, that Jesus is stronger than the storm that you're facing. And that in that storm, you can draw close to him. There is no reason to panic. So, Father, we ask that you would put your blessing upon this place and that we would continue to strive towards you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, go on.